Okay, uh, welcome. Um, so uh, my presentation is called John Wick Masculinity and the Limits of Revenge. Um, this is a sketch of an idea, um, and I'm, I have sort of a question section at the end that I'd like us to, uh, I'd like to sort of group, uh, get a group think going on about um, where we can go with this. Um, so what I'm going to be doing uh, today, trying to do anyway, is chart a progression of Wick as he's uh, situated within um, a larger cinema of action. Um, and what I'm looking at are the ways in which the Wick films start out as being a certain type of action spectacle and end up as a different type of action spectacle, and the ways in which John Wick, um, as someone who can transverse those boundaries, is, is a unique type of character. So he moves from uh, a revenge action star to a rampage action star, from a hard character, a hard masculine character to a, or sorry, a soft masculine character to a hard masculine character, from a domesticated character to a wild character. Um, what I'll be arguing is that this movement is inevitable because of the structure of a revenge plot action movie. Um, it sort of requires the destruction of a domestic space that um, can't be maintained once we keep destroying it. Um, and then, like I said, finally, that, that Wick is a hybrid action character, someone who is both hard and soft and both domestic and wild. Um, so a little bit about action cinema and spectacular action cinema. Uh, Action cinema is about male bodies and about violence. Um, and it's about uh, providing audiences with violence they desire to see, um, but masking it in certain ways that it feels justified. Uh, so the aesthetics of the film have been talked about at length at this conference, um, and so I don't want to belabor that point too much, but Wick arises out of the sort of um, shaky cam aesthetic that's popularized by the Bourne movies in the early 2000s and carries through. Um, and these are really uh, sort of defined by their discontinuous editing. Um, so there's a couple things of note in shaky cam action films um, beyond just the chaotic editing that breaks a lot of tech, uh, technical rules such as the 180 degree boundary um, and sort of any sort of continuity to the editing. Uh, it's additionally the camera is frequently too close. Um, it situates the spectator in the middle of the violence. Um, we're often in between two characters as they're engaging with each other. Our perspective gets flipped and shifted. It's all about capturing the chaos of what it would like be like to be in combat. And so the spectator is sort of thrust into the action in a very personal way, and the authenticity there is about the authenticity of experience. Okay? Um, the, what the WIF films do is they focus on uh, steady cam, um, handheld but still steady, long distance shots, so shots that capture um, subjects, both subjects or all subjects in a frame, um, and then long duration shots. So the editing is no longer quick and choppy, um, but gives us the spectacle to watch and to see clearly. The Wick films want to capture realism through showing off the technique and ability of our heroes. Um, additionally, Wick's violence is something that's mythologized by other characters. Um, we don't have to see him perform all these hurt acts. We get characters talking about them. Uh, we've got the impossible task, or we've got the fact that he killed a guy with a fucking pencil, right? Um, so uh, these, these, these stories that get told are about mythologizing this spectacle of action and making us anticipate um, what we're about to see. And this quote from Peirce in, in 2011, what I really want us to get from that is the connection between um, the exerting body and the spectacle, okay? Action cinema, as I said, is about the spectacle of violence and the male body. With the first two quotes up there, what I really want us to pay attention to, or what's going to really be important for this, this talk, is the, the dual elements of masculinity. On the one hand, Cannell tells us that uh, the male body is a central part of masculinity, that the, the physical body itself um, is key to understanding concepts of masculinity. And what Tasker tells us is that on the other hand, masculinity is tied to power um, and potency, and I would start also argue omnicompetence is a, is a crucial component of masculinity, this ability to be competent in, in many different and multiple fields. Well, what I'm interested in talking about mostly though is the hard, soft dynamic uh, that Susan Bordeaux touches on in her 1990 book, The Male Body. What Bordeaux uh, gets at in, in this book um, is that this conflation with, with masculinity as being simultaneously about the body and simultaneously about um, power 
cause us to focus on uh, masculinity as binary and, and uh, dual in this way. Um, and since we're talking about the body, uh, we're really, when we, when we focus on hard and soft, we're kind of focusing on, or she focuses on, the penis or the phallus, which I know are not interchangeable terms. Uh, but she, she sort of uh, asks us to look at them as somewhat interchangeable. So, you know, penises can be soft, they can be hard. Um, and when she talks about hardness, and when we'll think about hardness, what I really want to get at is hardness being about things like performance, domination, strength, the, the aforementioned omnicompetence, um, invulnerability, um, these, these very strong signifiers. When we're talking about softness, um, what we'll be thinking about are things like emotion, empathy, vulnerability, okay. um, this, this, uh, this sort of dynamic opposition to the heart. Okay. Now, what Bordeaux laments is that when we think about the body in this dual way, and we think about masculinity in this dual way, what we end up with is a privileging of the hard, the wild, um, and rampage over the soft or the domestic. Okay? And so essentially, softness, instead of becoming an equally relevant signifier, and an equally correct way to be a man, becomes weakness, it becomes um, sort of inadequate masculinity. Okay? And that's a really crucial point to understand why we're constantly trying to move and why the film's constantly trying to move Wick away from that softness throughout um, the film, or the series. Um, so on this slide we'll talk about uh, the two different types of action films um, that, that I'll identify. I've got some examples up top, and, and I'll sort of jump back and forth on this slide. Um, revenge movie examples, so things I'd like you to think about, and I'm really talking about more recent action movies, 80s, 90s, 2000s, and, and 2010s. Um, examples of a revenge movie are things like Die Hard or Lethal Weapon, in which a character has been wronged in some very explicit, strong way, um, and is therefore out for revenge. Okay, pretty simple concept. Rampage movies are different, however. They deal with characters that are let loose. They're, let, they're allowed to run wild and engage with that uh, violent masculinity. Um, rampage movies lean into this idea that masculinity is... Thanks, Steve. They're, they're excited for their soccer game. Um, <laughs> I'm loud, but I don't know if I'm that loud. Uh, rampage, move, ra rampage action heroes uh, are allowed to embrace this wild hardness that's, that's inside of every man and let it loose and let it fly. Um, and so for examples there, I have the Predator film with Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, or Rambo, First Blood Part Two. Um, anyone who's watched the original Rambo knows that it's actually a much softer film than, than uh, we might think about. Um, so I'm basing this uh, rampage and, and revenge uh, dynamic off of Fred Field's book, White Guys. Um, and, and what Field's doing in this book is talking about how the action cinema is a cinema of the angry white man. Um, and what these two films do are find ways to negotiate this desire to be angry and white. Well, I guess the white is inherent there. Um, but to be angry men um, and providing excuses and outlets uh, uh, for that violence. Okay. What Feel identifies as being crucial, this is why we start in the 80s, is that these forms of act, violent action movies um, come out in response to uh, second wave feminism and this perceived softening of the male. Um, so there's, especially in the 80s with, with the Reagan presidency, there's a callback to a more ancient type of masculinity, a more rugged type of masculinity, and a high anxiety about what feminism has done to men. Um, and it's made us soft, it's made us more like women, it's blurred those boundaries. Um, so we'll start with revenge movies um, because that's where John Wick starts. It starts out as a revenge movie. Crucial things to understand about revenge movies. First of all, that they weaponize vulnerability. What I mean by that is that um, they use the character's vulnerability as an excuse for him to transition into a violent 
um, sort of series of actions. Um, they take that vulnerability and make it into a strength. He is wrong, and therefore he is fully justified in his violence. Um, and secondly, revenge movies always have some sort of anxiety about domesticity. When we look at our examples there of Die Hard and Lethal Weapon, um, Die Hard, if you remember, there's a huge anxiety about his wife's job and how his wife is a higher earner than him um, and him coming to this upper class society that his wife is inhabiting um, and their marriage is in shambles. Uh, he's a sort of a blue collar cop and she's a high functioning corporate woman. Um, and that anxiety is the location for all the violence. Her, her corporate world, this Nagasaki Tower, um, becomes the location for all this violence. And with Lethal Weapon, um, what we see in action in, in this type of revenge movie that I feel identifies is that frequently um, the wild character needs to be domesticated and tempered through some sort of buddy cop. Um, and both Die Hard and Lethal Weapon feature a black buddy character, a buddy cop type of character who is domesticated, both these characters are. Mary, right, Murtaugh and um, Carl in um, Die Hard are both married men who are not wild and therefore temper and allow that wildness to be softened in some way. Okay, that's very crucial to uh, the, the uh, revenge movie. Okay, so that tension between this, this wild desire and the soft domestic self is negotiated or mediated through that buddy. Rampage movies, on the other hand, embrace wildness. Okay, so they uh, are often feature a complete lack of domesticity. Mar Rambo, for example, not married. Um, in Predator, for example, we have no female characters or any interest in female characters. There's no even bother with a love story of any kind. These are just men out in the wilderness being wild. Okay, and that return to the wilderness is, is really crucial, as we see. Um, you know, Predator. I said phallic, muscular bodies, and large guns. Um, this swollen masculinity of the 80s is very much a, a response to this castration of feminism. Right? Um, and in Rambo, you have the return of the wilderness. He's going back to Vietnam. And there's that, the famous line from Rambo, part, First Blood Part Two, is, do we get to win this time? Right? Yes, yes, so do I get to win this time? Um, indicating that the, the losses of the Vietnam War were because of the soft male politicians back home. Right? That, that Rambo was sort of figuratively castrated in that way. Um, and, and so these movies require the absence of that domestic. Like I said, we'll start with the uh, revenge movie and think about how Wick fits in within that. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about, and I'm going to jump forward a couple slides, but then I'm going to come back, is uh, Wick's house is a layer cake of wild and domestic tension and anxiety. This, this, in order for it to be a revenge movie, which I think the which I think it is, um, there needs to be tension about Wick's place in this domestic sphere. Um, and I just kind of looked, obviously I'm not an architect, so the architect presentations were much more thorough and I learned a lot um, yesterday about them. But when I looked at this uh, shot of, this is the ground floor, um, and I thought about this as the, as the balance floor. Um, so this is the balance between Wick's edgier hardness and his wife's soft domesticated. Um, and so when I look at this shot, for example, what jumps out to me is the sort of harsh edges um, of the upper level of the, that ground floor, uh, contrasted with the softer um, furniture of the bottom level of that ground floor. And so I see Wick and his wife in harmony in this scene, in this ground floor representing the harmony of the marriage. Um, and the hardness of Wick is there, but it is counterbalanced by the softness of his wife. Um, I'll additionally note that these, this uh, floor of the house is frequently shot in bluish lighting, um, highly desaturated, and that's important that we look at the next slide. Oh. So the, <laughs> I know, she's so cute. Um, the second floor, the bedroom, um, in this shot in particular, when Daisy is there, we, when we first see him wake up, it is a little bluer, and I know that that might be a, a counterpoint to mine, but I, I'd say it's before she, he gets Daisy. When he has Daisy, you'll notice that the lighting here is much warm. Um, and this, the elements of that second floor, which are just the bedroom, is highly softened. Okay, we have soft, warm lighting. Um, we have the soft, incredibly fluffy bed um, that, that Wick likes to lie in. 
and we have Daisy on that bed. And so all of these are signifiers of his wife. And so when I'm thinking about this layer cake, the upper level is his wife's space. It's the totally domesticated softer space. Okay. Um, and what has he defined that? And then when we look at the basement, <laughs> where John has buried his wildness or attempted to bury it, which is important to note that he doesn't destroy it, he simply buries it, it's, it's underneath, and he's built this domestic foundation on top, literally on top of his violence. Um, and that's, that's important for a couple of things. I think uh, to deviate slightly from before I talk about the frame itself, um, the more the films go on, the more we learn about John's domestic world is only, cap only possible because of his incredibly violent actions during the impossible task, right? So his violence is what gets him that domestic space, and he built, so he's literally built this domestic space on top of that violence, both literally and figuratively. So when he comes down to the basement to dig up his wild self again, um, you'll notice that the light here is high contrast, um, low key, and uh, again, highly blue, um, or even greenish in nature, okay? So that cooler temperature there, the harsher lighting, um, what we see um, is the tension in these two, the, the top level and the most bottom level, are the extremes of that hard soft dynamic in the middle level where they live together is that balance uh, of the layer tip. So Wick's soft domestic space is upended by the loss of his wife in the invasion. And what we are meant to see throughout this film is that Wick's softness um, was never a maintainable state. And throughout the three films, we get we get characters frequently marking on this could never have been permanent. Once you dip your toe back in, you're in. Um, that his hardness is always something that he's tried to concrete over, but concrete, as we learned in the beginning of the first film, is, is breakable. Um, the murder of the dog opens the door for acceptable revenge violence. Okay, so there always has to be an excuse or a re reason, like I said, that uh, that uh, domesticity, uh, sorry, the vulnerability gets weaponized. So the dog represents that vulnerability, that loss, that allows him to weaponize himself. Now what's interesting about the Whip films is that they were missing a buddy character to help him me mediate or negotiate that tension between his domestic self and the wild self. We can say the dog might fit that, but the dog's not there in the first film. I thought, in, I, I think a complication here might be uh, the Continental. Um, where he has residence, um, and then thinking about uh, Chiron as, as sort of this mediating figure, but that buddy cop is not present throughout the series, okay? So there's nothing to negotiate or constrain that wildness, so I, that's an important thing to think about. John's vulnerability, um, while I think amply acted by, uh, ably acted by Keanu Reeves, still needs to be remarked upon. The, the, the filmmakers <laughs> need us to understand that he's vulnerable, and so he has, um, is it Addy? Yeah, he has Addy sort of narrativize, uh, verbalize the thing that we're supposed to be picking up visually. Um, <laughs> um, so John is vulnerable, right? She says, I've never seen you like this. He says, like, what? Vulnerable. Um, and at that moment, we haven't seen him be fully fully unleashed, we've seen him a little bit violent yet, but, but this concept, this idea that he's vulnerable is highly important to the narrative of the first film. Now he completes the revenge plot in John Wick, and that completion of the revenge plot leaves him with his house um, and his, his ability to return to that soft light, which is generally consistent with a revenge plot movie, and if we just ended the series of John Wick 1, I think we'd have a pretty standard revenge movie. However, these anxieties about his domestic world and his balance between his domestic life, represented by his lo love of his wife, um, con continue through John Wick 3. So how can it be both revenge and rampage? Well, the important element of John Wick 2 that transitions us into being a rampage movie is the removal of the domestic space. So Santino D'Antonio literally blows up his house, destroys the house, um, and he returns to John Wick 2 at the end to that destroyed house. Um, and I think bookending the film with those two things is, tells us how important that destruction of the house was. Rampage movies, unlike revenge movies, like I said, require the, the removal, and we're losing more and more of that. 
And not only does his house get destroyed, we also note that these important details about his life with his wife were removed as well, right? The pictures get burned up. We watch those pictures burn up. Um, he's only able to find one memento, this, this, her, her uh, necklace, right? Um, and so the destruction of these domestic memories is about removal and the complete removal of that domestic space. So throughout John Wick 2 and John Wick 3, he consistently resists temptations to fall back into that domestic self and to more fully embrace the rampage side of himself and that wildness within himself. And I think a great example of that is his constant choice to leave the dog at, at the Continental. So the dog's only role that it plays is to just get dropped off at the Continental, and then he picks him back up by the end of the movie, and, and that's where we're at. Um, and so that dog, understanding that dog is a tie back to, back to his domestic life, is a reminder of his, um, his, his life with his wife. He leaves that in that domestic space and then goes out and, and does his wild things. That additionally is important when we think about the role of the buddy. If the dog could function as a buddy um, cop, it's left behind. Right? And so he leaves that tether to the domestic space behind in order to fully embrace the wildness. Again, in John Wick 3, we see him go to the library and get that book out. And he takes the picture of, of him and his wife out, but instead of keeping it with him, he puts it back into the book. Closes the book and puts it back on the shelf. And I think that's a really crucial moment to understanding um, the, the visual language of, I'm putting this domestic space back away. And, and I'm sort of unleashing myself. And then the most important, I think, rejection of the, the domestic is when he goes to the desert. And um, in order to completely reject that, which, um, you know, we've talked a lot in the, during the conference about that, uh, well, uh, you know, you would you rather be alive and remember her? Um, I always watched those scenes and thought, this is an excuse to just be violent, like to, to go be violent again. Um, there's nothing, it doesn't really have as much to do with remembering his wife. It almost felt like Keanu's, or uh, John Wick got talked into that um, more than it was an actual genuine thing, right? Because of manip Winston manipulates him back the other way. And he seems to be uncertain about how he wants to negotiate or excuse the violence he wants to do with relation to his wife. And um, when, um, oh, D'Antonio, oh, the female D'Antonio, Gianna. Gianna. When Gianna excoriates him about what would your wife think, I think that's the truest version of his relationship with his wife and violence. Right. Um, and so John's asked to and participates in the removal of his ring finger. Now, what I find interesting about this scene, yeah, you no just way. have to watch it over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is really important for a couple reasons. <laughs> um, it would be one thing to ask John to remove his ring. That would be a rejection of the marriage itself, a rejection of his past life. What the removal of the finger does is it ensures that he is no longer able to enter into a future domestic relationship. Right? He's never able to put a wedding ring on again. Okay, I, mean, I guess you could work around this. But yeah. <laughs> theoretically, um, and they then burn that wound shut, right? So that that uh, sort of cauterization seals that wound um, and ensuring that he will never be able to be domesticated again. And I think that is a pretty um, generous reading of where we're going next with John Wick 4. I don't anticipate him getting remarried or something by the end of that film. <laughs> I could be wrong. Um, but I think it's pretty safe to say that John Wick 4 will be a rampage movie. So um, the, the movement from revenge movie to rampage movie, the movement from soft to hard, the movement from domestic to wild is inevitable because these films require destruction and negotiation of domestic spaces. And if you're destroying domestic spaces, eventually you run out of domestic spaces to destroy. And that embracing of wildness um, is John's only path forward. As the director said, they had to and up the ante every time, and as you up, up the ante every time, we're getting more and wild. So, a couple questions as I as I wrap up. I'd like us to think about the racial politics that are at play. Field's book is called White Guys, right? And it's about white male rage and the acceptability of it. 
And so I'm thinking about the uh, racial politics at play for Wick, who, despite having a strong Anglo-sounding name, John Wick, um, we found out he's actually John Donnie John Janovich, right? Um, and that Eastern European element to him, um, and also for Keanu himself, who identifies as a person of color, right? And so do these, um, how does his sort of hybrid or unreadable racial, um, uh, racial skin or, or, or makeup, how does that factor into understanding him as an, as an angry white guy, which I don't think he is. And then I would also ask, is, is John Wick hypermasculine? Okay, does he fit into some updated notion of hypermasculinity? Um, is he vulnerable, or is that just something Addy has to say because otherwise we wouldn't notice it? <laughs> um, I'm also interested in how the continental complicates Wick's domesticity. Okay. Oh, and with the racial politics of play, um, Dave, who's not here, Dave had a great comment about bisexual lighting. Um, and I thought that sort of hybridity uh, was really important to understanding the, the racial politics play as well. Um, so how does the comp continental complicate Wick's domesticity? Remember, he does not, he ends up with the Bowery at the end who are literally homeless people, okay? So if we're removing the domestic, John goes from a happy domestic life to homeless, right? And so that's where I'm asking, where are we left in the end? He's not Arnold, he's not the completely wild, hyper, hyper masculine, muscular guy. Um, but he's not domesticated again, he's homeless. And so uh, that's, that's sort of a complicated um, thing to think about as well. Um, and questions I hope we can maybe come up with in the end. Um, so uh, if you ever want to get in touch with me, these are the ways. I appreciate you listening. Thanks for um, having me here.